So I'm uh, Frank Bennett, and I'm uh, pleased to introduce this year's uh, uh, Leslie Brenner uh, uh, awardee for the Innovation in Science. It's uh, Dr. Scott Zeitlin. And uh, Scott is an example of a scientist that very much fits the mold that uh, Dr. Bargman uh, described earlier, is that Scott created a lot of tools that we all, uh, all the scientists in this room currently use. He uh, has been working on Huntington's disease for well over 20 years. And in that period of time, he's been investigating uh, the, what, what is the role of the normal Huntington protein, uh, which is the, uh, the gene that's been modified in patients with Huntington's disease, and what is the role of the mutant Huntington protein, that, that, why is it causing the disease? And to do that, he's created a number of mouse models that he's uh, kindly shared with the community. And uh, I, I will say that the mouse models that he's created are probably used by most scientists that are studying Huntington's disease. And they not only support the basic research that's going on in Huntington's disease, but they also support the work that companies like uh, Ionis or the company that I work for uh, do to discover drugs that may someday help uh, uh, treat uh, patients with Huntington's disease. And so Scott really uh, is, is an example of, uh, exemplifies what a Huntington researcher should be and very much fits the mold that uh, Dr. Bargman uh, described earlier. And so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Scott Zeitlin. Thank you very much, Frank. You're one of my heroes, actually, in, in the field of HD research in terms of the uh, finding a way of hunt lowering Huntington safely. And um, it's really an honor to present to you tonight and what I'd like to do is tell you a little story about some of our recent work uh, using mouse models to compare Huntington lowering as a, as a therapy and comparing the effects of selectively lowering just the abnormal version of Huntington to, abnorming, uh, to reducing total Huntington in these mouse models. And I think everyone in the HD research community has one shared goal, and that is to develop cures for the disorder and to get effective treatments for Huntington's disease. And our lab, from the very beginning, since the gene was discovered, has been uh, developing different kinds of mouse models to understand the biology of Huntington and also to use these mouse models to test potential therapeutic strategies. And I'd like to point out that in 2012, Holly Kardasiewicz, along with Frank Bennett and colleagues at IONIS, in collaboration with Don Cleveland at UC San Diego and scientists from Genzyme and Novartis, published what I consider to be a groundbreaking study in the development of Huntington lowering therapies. And uh, this study showed that just a very transient administration of an antisense oligo oligonucleotide that lowers total Huntington had a sustained benefit, therapeutic benefit, in three different mouse models for Huntington's disease. This was truly a breakthrough. And it led directly to the phase three clinical trial that's being run by Roche in collaboration with Ionis. And I think we're all looking forward to very nice results from that soon. So the questions we wanted to answer, first, all good science answers some critical questions, but it always generates more questions. And the two questions that we wanted to answer was first, will a moderate reduction of, of either abnormal Huntington alone or total Huntington at younger ages be more beneficial than reducing Huntington in older HD model mice? The second question would be, will a reduction of total Huntington have any adverse consequences in comparison to reducing just abnormal Huntington. And the, the basis for the second question goes back to some early experiments that we did shortly after the discovery of the gene. And this was organized by Nancy Wexler in the Huntington Disease Collaborative Research Group. And many of those scientists are here tonight. And I applaud them. And what we did was to knock out the gene. And when we knocked out the gene, that means eliminating expression of Huntington Starting from conception, we observed that no mice were born. This shows that Huntington's very critical for embryonic development. And we went on to do a second generation uh, gene knockout. It's called conditional knockout. And we can 
eliminate expression of genes where we want and when we want using this technique. And we chose to explore what happens if you eliminate Huntington expression in the mouse brain shortly after birth. This image you see on the left of this slide is a section through a mouse brain. And uh, the top of the brain is at the top, the bottom of the brain is at the bottom. And you can see two brain regions that have a lot of dark speckles on them. One is the cortex that's on the periphery. And in the middle is the striatum, the region of the brain that's affected most by Huntington's disease. Each of these speckles corresponds to a neuron where Huntington is totally absent. And so we wanted to see what the consequences of that was for the mice. And the first test we did was to look at their motor coordination. We used something called an accelerating rotor rod. Think of a log rolling contest for mice where we control the speed and acceleration of the rod. The goal of the mouse is to stay on the rod as long as it can before it falls off. And a normal mouse can do pretty good. It learns to stay on the rod for a long length of time. And what I'm showing you is a test we did at six months. In red are mice that have lost Huntington expression in their forebrain, and they're doing just as well as mice that have normal levels of Huntington. However, when we looked at older mice at nine months, we could see that the mice that lack Huntington are now doing quite a bit worse than the mice that have normal levels of expression. And by 15 months of age, the mice lacking Huntington could barely stay on the rod more than a few seconds. We also wanted to look at their performance in memory tests. And we did this in 13-month-old mice, and we uh, tested their, what is called their spatial learning and memory. And we used something called a Barnes maze. This was invented by Carol Barnes. It's an elevated circular platform that has holes around the periphery, only one of which leads to an escape box. Mice, by their very nature, don't like to be out and exposed. And they would prefer to find an escape box as quickly as they can. And they learn it fairly quickly in our lab setting. And what I'm showing you here in the black data spot on the graph is the performance of normal mice over five days of trials. And you can see that each day they improve. And each day they take less time to find the escape box. And by the end of the test, they can do it within 30 seconds. Contrast that with the performance of the mice lacking Huntington in their forebrain. These mice do improve from day one to day two, but do not prefer, uh, improve at all in the further uh, days of the test. And indeed, they take about three times longer than the mice that have normal levels of Huntington. So based on these results, we were a little bit concerned about lowering Huntington as a therapeutic strategy. But the, these mice that I just described to you are not sufficient for testing how safe a total Huntington lowering therapy is. The main problem with the, the mice that I just told you about is we completely eliminate Huntington. And all the Huntington lowering strategies that are being developed for the first generation of treatments will only moderately lower total levels of Huntington. And we needed to model that in mice. So we had to generate new mouse models. What I'm showing you here is a diagram of the beginning of the mouse Huntington gene. Mice do not get Huntington. Their CAG triplet repeat is very short, encodes a short 7Q or 7 glutamine stretch. And it has a relatively simple proline rich region adjacent to it. What we did to regulate the expression of the abnormal version of Huntington, we first swapped out mouse DNA sequences with human sequences that encode a very long CAG triplet repeat. 140 glutamines are expressed in this abnormal version of Huntington, and also a longer and more complex proline-rich region. In addition, we needed to, to use genetic tricks to add two foreign DNA sequences to the control region of the gene. In just a second, I'll tell you the, the importance of those sequences. If, in addition, if we want to regulate the levels of total Huntington, we also have to generate another version of Huntington and that's a regulatable, humanized normal Huntington. It has a CAG repeat that encodes a 20Q stretch. This is what is an average normal length of the Q stretch in human Huntington. And it has the uh, humanized proline-rich region. It also includes the two foreign DNA sequences. Now, if you want to regulate just abnormal Huntington, 
we have to mate mice that contain normal mouse Huntington with mice that have the gene for the regulatable HD gene. This is the part of the experiment they love. We had to generate a lot of mice, and so they had a good time. But if we want to generate mice that lower total Huntington, what we simply do is we mate mice that have the regulatable HD version of the gene with mice that have the regulatable humanized normal gene. And to actually control the expression of these genes, we had to add a second element to our mouse models. And that is a protein that will bind to these foreign DNA sequences. When the protein is bound, expression is lowered moderately. And when the protein is not bound to those sequences, expression is at 100% level. And we can control the activity of that protein by adding or withdrawing a sugar-like compound from the mouse's drinking water. This compound is safe completely non-toxic, it's not metabolized so the mice don't get fat during our entire experiment, and in addition, it penetrates all tissues of the mouse. So this is an example of what it looks like for regulating in our mouse. So I hope each of you can see the bright green, uh, what look like dashes in this image. Each dash that's very bright, doesn't change in intensity from left and right, that's the normal mouse Huntington. It's non-regulatable. It doesn't change in levels. On the top is another set of dashed green bands. And these decrease in intensity going from left and right. What this represents is an experiment where we take away that sugar-like compound from the mouse's drinking water, and then we monitor Huntington lowering at different times after withdrawal of that compound. And what we see is we get about a 50% reduction of abnormal Huntington over a course of about two weeks. We can similarly look at the regulation of our uh, humanized normal Huntington. And in this particular case, we see about a 70 to 80% reduction. These examples are from the mouse striatum. Remember the region that most is affected in Huntington. We also tested many other brain regions and many peripheral tissues. And on average, we get a 50 to 60% lowering of, of Huntington. This is in the same ballpark as the antisense oligonucleotide therapy that's currently in phase three trial. So this is our experimental strategy. It's pretty simple. I'm showing you a timeline here. What we do is reduce either abnormal Huntington alone or total Huntington lowering, either at consumption, and this would be continuous reduction of Huntington, or at weaning, which occurs at 23 days in our experiment, at three months of age, six months of age, and nine months of age. And we test the mice as they age up through 18 months. I want to point out a, a critical time and age in these mice, which is six months. In our HD model, at this age, we begin to see the appearance of misfolded inclusions of abnormal Huntington in the nuclei of neurons in the striatum. And this pathology was first described by Jill Bates when she generated the first HD mouse model for the field, the R62. And so this is one of the first things we looked at, neuropathology in our mice. So we're lowering Huntington at different ages. And what we're doing is assessing the appearance of these inclusions of misfolded abnormal Huntington at nine months of age. And this is what they look like. No reduction of abnormal Huntington. You can see these purplish red spots those are the inclusions of misfolded abnormal Huntington, and they're found in nuclei which are stained with a blue dye. When we reduce total Huntington at six months, but again look at nine months, we see that the number of inclusions is slightly reduced but, and also their size, and this is much more easily seen when we reduce at a young, much younger age at 23 days. And here you can barely see any aggregates and they're very tiny in size. This is quantified in these plots below. The main take-home lesson here is either continuous reduction from conception, reduction at 23 days, and reduction at three months, you get a significant reduction in number and size of these inclusions. And even when we reduce at six months, remember this is when inclusions are already naturally starting to show up, we can still see a significant effect on number and on size. We also saw similar results by just lowering abnormal Huntington. So no difference between the two. We also looked in the general health of our mice, and we found that lowering either abnormal Huntington alone or total Huntington improved 
their general health as they aged. So for example, they maintained their normal weight for much longer, and they also maintained their forelimb grip strength for much longer. We also looked at their motor coordination. Remember I showed this apparatus earlier in, in the presentation? And so what we're doing is comparing no reduction of abnormal Huntington to just normal expression of Huntington. And so no reductions in red, expression of normal Huntington with no abnormal Huntington is in black. And you can see that the, the mice that are expressing full levels of abnormal Huntington are doing worse in the motor coordination test at six months of age. If we reduce at six months or nine months of age, these mice are performing similarly to the mice with no reduction of abnormal Huntington. And the, this makes perfect sense because at six months of age when we're testing, both of these groups of mice still have their 100% levels of abnormal Huntington. So they shouldn't be performing that well. Let's look what happens when we do the continuous reduction, reduction at weaning, or reduction at three months of age. We now see that these mice are performing just as well as the mice with just normal Huntington expression, doing very well at six months. So earlier reduction of, either, of total Huntington is having a great benefit at six months. However, we did not see this as the mice aged, either at 12 months or 18 months of age. And no matter what level of abnormal Huntington you have or when it was reduced, we still saw that these mice were all performing as poorly as if there was no reduction at all in their abnormal Huntington. So this is a different kind of result. The benefit that we see happened earlier in the life of these mice, but didn't extend to older ages as in some of the other tests that we had done. We also obtained similar results by just reducing abnormal Huntington. We also looked at their spatial learning and memory. This test, well, uh, what we're looking at here, again, I'm showing you in black the mice with just normal Huntington. They're doing better than the mice with no reduction of abnormal Huntington through the five days of trial. If we reduce from continuous re reduction to reduction at six months of age, they're all performing equally. And they're all performing equally as well as the mice just expressing normal Huntington. And we're doing this test in 17-month-old mice. So this particular test, in contrast to the motor coordination, shows extended benefits with earlier reduction of Huntington. If we reduce at nine months, it's an intermediate performance. Their, their performance is slightly worse than the earlier reduction, but also slightly better than no reduction at all. And similar, we obtained similar results by lowering just abnormal Huntington. And I'm, thank you for your patience, I'm now going to show you the last data slide. And this is very recent results that we got. We're very excited about it, so I'm showing this to you even though we have to test more mice to make sure that the results are completely valid statistically. But what we're looking at is the accumulation of DNA damage in our HD model mice. DNA damage accumulates with, as we age in all of us as part of the environment and also the normal physiology of neurons creates DNA damage. In Huntington's disease, it's been observed both in the human HD brain and also in HD mouse models that DNA damage is elevated, especially in the striatum. Huntington has also been recently proposed as one of its normal functions to participate in DNA damage repair. The consequences of DNA damage is that your DNA becomes fragmented over time. So what we're looking at here is the amount of fragmented DNA as a percentage of total DNA in individual nuclei that we purify from both the cortex and the striatum. So each data point you see here is a single nucleus. And what we saw is that we, when we reduced total Huntington at six months of age, we significantly reduced DNA damage in both the cortex and striatum in old 15-month mice. So these results are very encouraging to us. And I'll be honest, when we initially were hearing about the strategy to reduce total Huntington, we were a little worried about that. But I can confidently say that we are now very optimistic about the res positive results that will be coming out soon from the phase three clinical trial with the ASOs. 
And now I'd like to answer the first, the questions I posed at the beginning of this presentation. Is a moderate reduction of, at younger ages of Huntington more beneficial than at older ages? And the answer is yes, but the magnitude and duration of the benefit depends upon the test that we used. The second question, are there adverse consequences from reducing total Huntington in comparison to just targeted reduction of abnormal Huntington? And we have observed none at no adverse consequences so far, but we still have a little bit more to do with detailed neuropathology to completely lock that down. I'd also, from these results, I also would like to give you some of my personal perspectives in the future. And I'm very, very encouraged that the current generation one hunting and lowering therapies pioneered by uh, Ionis and Roche, they, they will provide us with a great window of, of opportunity to do, develop the next generation of therapies. And these next generation of therapies will be more efficient, they sh will require less dosing frequency, and they'll target more cells in the whole body and in the brain. Secondly, I'd like to stress the importance of understanding genetic modifiers that modify aged onset in Huntington's disease. This is the experiment done by nature to tell us what are key genes involved in when we get Huntington's disease, if you have the expansion. And I want to point out that the Hereditary Disease Foundation is at the forefront of supporting this kind of research. And it'll be extremely critical because when we discover new pathways to target, to treat Huntington's disease, they can be used in conjunction with the lowering therapies. And finally, the more HD models in different animal systems, the better for us. And it, this includes also human cell models because all of you are aware mice are not humans and anything that we discover in animal models, we need to validate in human cells. And this is where the induced pluripotent cells that Leslie Thompson is working on and the direct conversion of fibroblasts that Andrew Yu has, has pioneered and is being supported in this work by the HDF is so important for complementing the work in animal models. And this is, it's gonna be a, I think the future is fantastic. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people who did the work in my lab that I described to you tonight Derping Liu did most of the work with the assistance of Haley Johnson and Alan Joe. I'd also like to thank Deanna Marcianini from the CHDI Foundation, who was very helpful in designing the initial validation experiments of our regulated well, HD mouse models. Vinod Katarpal for doing the uh, pharmacokinetic experiments to look at our sugar-like compound in mice. At UCLA, I want to acknowledge Mike Levine, who's unfortunately not here tonight, and Marie-Francoise Chesselet, who is here, for a long-standing collaboration in the characterization of our 140Q knock-in mouse model. I'd also like to thank Heidi Scrabble, who uh, invented the regulation technique that we adapted to the HD models when she was at UVA before she moved to Mayo Clinic. Um, she was a fantastic friend and, and collaborator, and she is uh, now sorely missed. I, of course, like to thank Nancy and the Hereditary Disease Foundation. Nothing I described to you tonight would, not, would be possible without her initial support. She recruited me to the HD community, and it's more than a community, it's an HD research family. And uh, the CHDI Foundation for funding the development of the regulatable models, and NIH and INDS for con uh, supporting continued studies of looking at the normal function of Huntington in my lab. And last but not least, and the most important, I want to thank you for, for your patience in paying attention tonight, and also for helping all of us in the research community find a cure for Huntington's disease. Thank you very much.